Good morning. Thank you for joining us. To start us off right today, I'll hand over now to Craig Madden from the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council to open today's event. Thank you, Leanne. Wujiri Gamarua, everyone. Good day and welcome. My name is Craig Madden, and I'd like to start by thanking the Human Rights Commission for inviting me online today to welcome you on the country. I'm a proud Bunjalung Gadigal man from Eora Nation, and Gadigal land is the land on which I am standing on here today. Jinyura Gadigal. This land is Gadigal. It is customary for our Aboriginal people to invite guests or visitors onto our land or country. And it's a practice that we've been doing for thousands of years, offering you safe passage as you pass through our lands. So I'm extremely proud to stand before you as a representative of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and a proud Gadigal man and welcome you all into Aboriginal land, my land, Gadigal land. We respect and honour our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers, elders past, present and future and acknowledge the stories and traditions of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this land. To any Aboriginal brothers and sisters, if you have any brothers and sisters from the Torres Straits, welcome. To all our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters online today, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. Our Gadigal clan is one of the 29 clans that make up the Eora nation. It's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we have the Hawkes River to the north, the Nepean River to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Within the boundaries of those mighty rivers lie Eora nation, and the land that I'm one of the Gadigal people, one of the many clans of that nation. Do you have any guests from across the seas today? from across our great country, great states, and this magnificently beautiful city of ours, welcome. Whatever Aboriginal nation that you are standing on today, welcome. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and its members, our Gadigal mob, please enjoy the oration today. Also, please stay safe. And once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for that generous welcome to country. I too am joining our oration this morning from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. I acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I stand with our First Nations elders, sisters and brothers in support of the full realisation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Happy Human Rights Day to you all and welcome to the 2021 Australian Human Rights Commission Human Rights Day Oration. The 10th of December is the most significant day in the human rights calendar. It was on this day in 1948 that the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which famously begins with the powerful affirmation that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Around the world, this day is commemorated as Human Rights Day. And today we mark the 73rd anniversary of this defining document that has helped to frame the modern age. The Universal Declaration emerged out of crisis as a response to the horrors of the Second World War. What the past two years have shown us is that its guiding value for humanity is never more important nor more necessary than in times of emergency. In this instance, the global pandemic that we have all faced. We should not underestimate the importance of setting aside a day to commemorate, educate and reflect on the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and what it means, as well as celebrating the rights we exercise every day as Australians. Enjoying those rights carries with it the responsibility of promoting these rights for all people. And yet things that many of us take for granted, such as the right to an education, the right to receive medical care, even the right to food and housing are not equally available to all Australians, nor to people in many other parts of the world. We must not take these rights for granted. Today, individuals and communities all over the world will be commemorating and celebrating and pledging a commitment to maintain and improve people's human rights. We are proud and glad to join with them. Some of you may be aware of an important project the Australian Human Rights Commission is currently investing in. 
Free and Equal, an Australian conversation on human rights. Through Free and Equal, we're aiming to promote awareness of the importance of human rights to 21st century Australia to identify current limitations and barriers to achieving better discrimination laws and human rights protections in this country, to identify what key principles should underpin the reform of discrimination law and human rights law in Australia, to build agreement across the parliament, government and the community about what we can do collectively to better promote, protect and fulfil human rights. And finally, to set a reform agenda with recommendations to improve and strengthen anti-discrimination and human rights law protections in Australia. The work that informs the position paper that President Croucher will launch at today's Human Rights Day oration is the culmination of an extensive national consultation process over the last couple of years. So it's my pleasure now to introduce and welcome our 2021 Human Rights Day Orator, Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher AM, President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, to deliver her oration, Bringing Rights Home, the case to modernise federal discrimination law. Professor Croucher commenced her seven-year term as Commission President in July 2017. Prior to joining the Commission, she was President of the Australian Law Reform Commission, where she led and oversaw a number of significant law reform inquiries, including on family violence, age barriers to work, disability laws, encroachment on freedoms in Commonwealth laws, elder abuse and native title. Professor Croucher had a distinguished career in legal education with 25 years in university teaching and management. She was Dean of Law at both Macquarie University and Sydney University and lectured and published extensively, principally in the fields of equity, trusts, property, inheritance and legal history. She was appointed a member of the Order of Australia in 2015 for significant service to the law as an academic to legal reform and education, to professional development and to the arts. In 2014, she was also acknowledged for her contributions to public policy as one of Australia's 100 Women of Influence in the Australian Financial Review and Westpac Awards. I now invite Professor Croucher to deliver the 2021 Human Rights Day oration. Thank you, Leanne. And thank you, Craig, for that wonderful welcome to country as well. On behalf of the Australian Human Rights Commission, I echo Leanne's sentiments in saying, welcome to Human Rights Day for 2021. I am speaking today from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I too pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the traditional custodians of the lands from wherever you may be joining me today. As I reflect on the past two years on Human Rights Day, it is clear that the pandemic has brought a renewed national focus on the importance of centralising human rights during times of crisis. It is a very good thing to have this focus on how we can provide the best protection to all members of our society, how we give the best support to the most vulnerable, and how we can promote the overall well-being of everything and everyone in Australia. Governments have prioritised public health and, in the main, done well, and largely sought to justify their actions but they haven't always got everything right here or overseas, and we are by no means at the end point of the pandemic. Our challenge in the after is to ensure that human rights remain central to government decision making on an ongoing basis. And that is where the Commission's free and equal project comes in. When I first announced that the Commission would conduct a national conversation on human rights, my goal was to develop a roadmap 
that would guide government action and community partnerships to fully realize human rights and advance equality. I wanted to be ambitious in setting targets to address inequality, to reimagine our system of protections so that we can provide everyone with the opportunity to be the best that they can be. It was aspirational and forward-looking based on the question of what kind of Australia do we want for our children and our children's children. I anticipated that we would develop a reform agenda, a roadmap in three parts. Today, following an extensive consultation process in 2020 and 2021, we are releasing the first part of that roadmap. The Commission's position paper on federal discrimination law reform. We provide 38 recommendations covering every aspect of our federal discrimination law system to ensure that it offers robust protection against discrimination, provides better support for businesses and organisations to do the right thing, and is simpler to use. Why is reform needed? Put simply, Australia's discrimination laws are falling short. They are outdated and they are difficult to use. And some of these laws have remained substantially untouched since they were introduced over 30, even 40 years ago. These laws do not respond to the challenges of modern life. They are often unsuccessful as a means of remedying discrimination, let alone preventing it. There are a number of key problems. First, addressing discrimination is heavily reliant on individuals to bring complaints rather than on more systemic approaches to building cultures of prevention within businesses, services, and the institutions of public life. The focus should shift to preventing discrimination rather than reacting to it after the fact. Secondly, the regulatory framework is out of date and needs strengthening. There should be a full range of regulatory responses available to target discrimination of different kinds at different levels of severity and to engender understanding and certainty about legal obligations. Federal discrimination laws do not provide adequate support to the business sector to take proactive efforts to address potential discrimination. Thirdly, the discrimination system, while offering a range of options, can be difficult to navigate and legal remedies difficult to access with the result that many meritorious claims may not be pursued in courts. Individuals need the tools to obtain access to justice. Fourthly, with, for now, four sets of federal discrimination laws alongside state and territory instruments and overlapping regimes such as fair work, the mix of discrimination laws is complex and sometimes inconsistent, which leads to difficulties in applying the law. There are also gaps in protection, so some people are not protected at all by discrimination laws or are unable to obtain access to a remedy for discriminatory conduct. What then are the solutions? During the consultation process, I crystallised key areas of reform into four thematic categories, the four pillars of our law reform agenda. These are building 
a preventative culture. Modernizing the regulatory framework. Enhancing access to justice. And improving the practical operation of laws. I will speak to each in turn. Pillar one, building a preventative culture. Many people who experience discrimination are unable or unwilling to bring a complaint because of the stress and trauma often associated with the experience. Our most recent survey about sexual harassment, for example, showed that fewer than one in five people who said they experienced workplace sexual harassment in the last five years had made a formal report or complaint, or even sought support or advice. Positive duties are an emerging feature of discrimination and workplace laws in Australia and overseas, reflecting a shift to a preventative focus in dealing with discrimination and avoiding harm. These are not new ideas. For example, work health and safety laws already include a positive duty on employers. In the Commission's 2020 Respect at Work report into workplace sexual harassment, led by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, we recommended the introduction of a positive duty to take measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation. The government will shortly commence consultations on this recommendation as part of its response to respect at work. However, sex discrimination in the workplace is only one aspect of federal discrimination law. We advocate that a positive duty be included in all discrimination laws, requiring organisations to take reasonable and proportionate measures in accordance with their size and resourcing to eliminate unlawful discrimination. The benefit of positive duties is that they are focused on instituting change rather than on fault. A positive duty would support businesses to take steps to embed non-discrimination measures into their operations. It would also benefit businesses by helping to prevent individual claims of discrimination from being brought against them. The Business Council of Australia, for example, commended the approach in work health and safety laws for their focus on encouraging prevention as part of the obligations imposed by those provisions. This focus on prevention builds a different mindset into all aspects of a business to ensure that these obligations are met. There are also strong economic incentives for pro protective measures, proactive measures. Deloitte, for example, estimated that sexual harassment was costing the Australian economy $3.8 billion annually. That's a staggering figure. Overall, a positive duty would rebalance the discrimination law system to focus on prevention rather than redress, and is therefore a key measure towards improving the effectiveness of discrimination law in Australia. Respect at Work recognised this. In this paper, we have taken it further. It is pillar one of our reforms. Pillar two, modernising the regulatory framework. The alternative dispute resolution processes used by the Commission to handle discrimination complaints can be an empowering process for complainants and can be very effective at achieving both individual and systemic 
outcomes. However, the compliance framework that operates alongside this is extremely limited. Individual complainants and the ADR process should not bear the bulk of responsibility for ensuring compliance with discrimination laws. The Commission's regulatory powers have remained effectively untouched since our permanent establishment in 1986. By contrast, since the Abbott government introduced the Regulatory Powers Standard Provisions Act in 2014, most other regulatory agencies across the Commonwealth of Australia have had their frameworks reviewed and modernised, with many tools now at their disposal to address different kinds of issues. This has also resulted in standardising some of these tools across jurisdictions, leading to greater business certainty and simplicity. Alas, federal discrimination law has not been reviewed in light of these major reforms. Modernising the regulatory framework for the Australian Human Rights Commission is a neglected part of that agenda. We put forward reforms that reflect the concept of responsive regulation based on Professor John Braithwaite's regulatory pyramid. Using this theoretical conceptualization, a range of different approaches are required to achieve compliance with the law. This includes capacity building, where there is an inability to comply, and more coercive powers towards the top of the pyramid, where there is an unwillingness to comply. These higher order powers provide leverage, the leverage that having such powers can bring in enforcing obligations, even when not exercised. The availability of the stick can be a very effective carrot to shift behaviour towards a compliance mindset. Currently, the Commission has large gaps in its regulatory framework, particularly at the top end of the pyramid. We are recommending a range of measures to fill some of those gaps with a particular focus on co-regulation. These include a new power to conduct inquiries that we initiate ourselves into systemic discrimination. We are already trusted to conduct major systemic inquiries into sexual harassment in the workplace, for example, such as respect at work, into gymnastics in Australia, change the routine, and more recently into parliamentary workplaces, set the standard. And Basketball Australia engaged the Commission to undertake a racial equality review of the sport at a national level. As we are the body that receives, on average, 15,000 inquiries a year and 2,000 complaints, numbers which I should emphasize have been blown out of the water in the past two years. But having those numbers of inquiries and complaints, the Commission has particular insights into areas where systemic inquiries would be beneficial. Our proposed framework is designed to help businesses and enable certainty and support through co-regulatory measures. These include the power to conduct voluntary reviews of policies or programs in terms of compliance with federal discrimination laws and to enable the Commission to issue special measure certifications where an action is proposed that confers a benefit on a group of people to reduce their experience of inequality such as targeted recruitment 
of people with disability. In short, the current regulatory scheme for federal discrimination law is hopelessly out of date. And there's a range of ways that the Commission could offer greater support to the business sector and that would likely result in a reduction in discrimination and reduce exposure to complaints. But this requires change to the legislative framework with greater capacity for the Commission to work in a proactive, preventative way. Pillar three, enhancing access to justice. Our conciliation processes do work well. We generally receive positive outcomes and high rates of satisfaction from all parties involved in discrimination law matters. But not all complaints are resolved through conciliation. So what then? Now, the only next is to proceed to the federal courts. And entering that arena can be extremely resource and time intensive. This discourages individuals from pursuing discrimination claims in court, many of them meritorious. Fewer than 3% of discrimination matters finalised by the Commission ever proceed to court. To improve access to justice outcomes for individuals, we propose reforms as to how costs are calculated in the courts, reforms to address difficult evidentiary issues for complainants without shifting the overall onus of proof, and reforms to enable representative actions taken on behalf of a group of claimants. An additional consideration is that there is no intermediate process that bridges the gap between voluntary conciliation at the Commission and litigation through the courts. There used to be, but it was removed. Until 2000, the Commission had an adjudicative function to make determinations in discrimination matters that could not be resolved by conciliation or negotiation. But this function was removed following the High Court decision in Brandy and Herriock in 1995. The amendment was to address problems raised by a process that had been introduced of registering determinations of the Commission as if they were judgments of the federal court. For the constitutional lawyers out there, this was a chapter three issue. But the solution went much further than addressing that question. We lost all the adjudicative hearing powers we had. In our position paper, we refer to this as the Brandy myth. The powers that were removed from the Commission went beyond what was necessary. Indeed, since the Brandy decision, other federal regulatory agencies have been granted or retained similar kinds of powers, such as the Fair Work Commission and Fair Work Ombudsman. New powers have also been developed in accordance with the Regulatory Powers Act. For example, the Office of the Information Commissioner, which itself used to be part of the Human Rights Commission, has seen its regulatory framework expand over time. By comparison, our powers have gone backwards to the detriment of all. Moreover, the lack of middle layer adjudication for complainants further limits the accessibility 
and availability of remedial options. For this reason, we recommend that the government give serious consideration to reintroducing an intermediate adjudicative process to bridge the gap between voluntary conciliation and federal court litigation, whether through the commission or through a tribunal-like body or new arbitral process. It has been a gap of over 20 years, which has not improved access to justice. Pillar four, improving the practical operation of laws. There are many recommendations within our package of reforms about improving the practical operation of laws. A number of them are technical in nature, designed to improve clarity and consistency over the various discrimination laws and in their practical applications, and to reduce the level of complexity across the system overall. Those of you who know and work in this area would cheer here. Importantly, we also recommend measures to close the existing gaps in discrimination law coverage to ensure that everyone is protected from discrimination. We support the introduction of a new federal ground of unlawful discrimination based on freedom of thought, conscience and religion to be appropriately balanced alongside existing discrimination grounds in accordance with Australia's international obligations. We are currently developing a submission on the Religious Discrimination Bill, which will be made public in the coming fortnight. We also recommend a ground to prevent discrimination based on a person's irrelevant criminal record. This is one of the grounds of discrimination in our Act relating to an International Labour Organisation Convention, ILO Convention. As the ground is not currently unlawful discrimination, there is no pathway to judicial consideration or enforceable remedies. And yet, we receive a significant number of complaints on this ground every year. And it is an area that has a disproportionate impact on some groups. Other proposed changes would close the gaps to make the law more inclusive of volunteers and interns in the workplace and those with family responsibilities. These modest changes would reflect the realities of the modern world of work. In conclusion, I present to you this roadmap for reform. Overall, we make 38 recommendations for discrimination law reform across these four thematic areas. The need for reform of federal discrimination law is urgent and consideration should be given to this as a matter of priority. We must address the overly complex nature of these laws and refocus the system so that it generates business confidence to take measures of prevention as the major focus, while also ensuring that the remedial aspects of the system are more effective and fairer. The discrimination law position paper is the first of three major outputs for the Free and Equal Project. Next, we will finalise an updated model for a federal human rights act alongside key related reforms to promote a positive human rights culture in Australia. We will then complete a final report of the project. Discrimination law reform is a critical piece of the puzzle, but it is not enough. National human rights legislation will enable Australia to finally have a complete, functional and effective system 
of rights protections. That too is long overdue. The pandemic has shown us that putting people at the centre and having debates about people's rights is possible. It has also shown us that no single piece of law reform is too hard or too much to undertake. It is time we applied that thinking to federal discrimination laws. Laws that would fit for the times in the 1970s and 1980s now need to evolve to meet the needs of the 21st century. I commend to you the Australian Human Rights Commission's reform agenda for federal discrimination law and encourage you to join us in advocating for change to ensure a fairer society for all Australians. I am now going to invite the Commission's Deputy General Counsel, Graham Edgerton, to join me for a Q&A session. But before then, I want to acknowledge the contribution of individuals and organisations in promoting and protecting human rights and freedoms. Therefore, it is my great pleasure to congratulate the winners of our 2021 Human Rights Awards in our three categories this year. In past years, when it was possible to hold an in-person event with hundreds of guests, these announcements would have been preceded by camera, cameo video clips, breathless anticipation and thunderous applause. I expect you to make up for this from wherever you are. First, the community human rights champion. The community human rights champion for 2021 is Plate It Forward, the community driven organization providing meals, training, and employment to vulnerable communities in Sydney. Plate It Forward recognizes that job creation and education are necessary for these communities to thrive and to access the fundamental human rights of connection, employment, and community. Secondly, the Young People's Medal. For her exceptional advocacy for better consent and education and raising the issue of sexual assault within schools to the national spotlight, the Young People's Medal winner for 2021 is Chanel Contos. Thirdly, the Top Gong, the Human Rights Medal. For her outstanding and ongoing contribution to enhancing the rights of Indigenous Australians through research and advocacy, the Human Rights Medal winner for 2021 is Professor Larissa Berendt, AO. All our 2021 Human Rights Award winners and finalists deserve to be applauded for their tireless devotion to making Australia a fairer place for all. Thank you, and again, Happy Human Rights Day 2021. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, Roz, for that very stimulating presentation and for giving us a preview of what we can expect with the position paper for the first part of the roadmap for free and equal. Um, one of the key issues that you touched on was about prevention. Moving from a society where we react to discrimination after it's happened to a society where we prevent it from happening in the first place. And an aspect of that that you pick up on in the paper is this idea of positive duties. Can you give us more of a flavour of what positive duties are? What do they look like in practice? In practice, it, it goes to embedding 
within organisations, the idea that, that they are responsible for creating safe, non-discriminatory environments for their people. An example that um, the Business Council of Australia introduced in our consultations was about a lettuce leaf. And it goes like this. Imagine a workplace like a supermarket and a lettuce leaf is found on the floor. A worker, knowing their obligations, will be mindful of the potential for injury from the fact of a lettuce leaf being on the floor and will automatically go to pick it up. So they won't be waiting for someone to be injured or for a complaint about the lettuce leaf on the floor before they pick it up. If you think about how that example might apply in the discrimination law context, it involves the duty that shifts the mindset so that the leaders of the organisation, understanding that duty, will lead the change in culture in understanding what the obligation is so that people are trained, that people react when they see things. So it, it, it's an obligation to look for the factors in a business that may lead to discrimination or harassment. And, and that idea would lead to greater visibility of the factors and it would also support practices that would avoid or address the, the potential for harm up front. I, I, I like I like that idea of of the image of the lettuce leaf, both as um, the safety of it itself, but also as a prompt to action. So it, it's a concern, but it's also something that symbolises action that needs to be taken to address a particular risk. Um, that's obviously a work health and safety issue, um, but we also need to think about translating that into the human rights sphere as well. Yeah, I mean, I can draw one one example that uh, resonates, I suppose, from. Um, the, the respected work inquiry yes. was where um, a, a workplace, the Minerals Council of Australia was very conscious of the problem of remote mine sites as a workplace. And there were a whole range of factors in that environment that perhaps set the scene for potential um, sexual harassment and, 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 and other situations that are unlawful under the Sexual Discrimination Act. So the combination of remote environments, separation from home, alcohol, those sorts of combinations of factors are a bit like the lettuce leaf mm. on the floor. It, it, it gives you the idea that you need to take some action because you know that the combination of those factors can lead to adverse outcomes, either in terms of discrimination or, or sexual harassment. Absolutely. And, and I mean, it if you think also, say, um, in terms of how how you could how you could be aware, there's there's all kinds of ways that um, awareness, like, like the awareness that the Minerals Council of Australia spoke to, um, for instance, in uh, in the goods and services arena, customers are always telling people things. You know, they're they're alerting to issues of accessibility of um, perhaps the, the way that um, signage is placed. So um, the, the, the fact of um, lack of um, language access in certain situations. So there's a lot of ways that you can start to think proactively about what are the kinds of things in my environment that may be um, may set up for situations that I don't want to happen to happen. So it's it's just thinking more strategically, more customer focused, more employee focused, more about the people that engage with you in in the the particular context that that you may be a leader in. It's really about listening to people, isn't it? It's listening to your customers. It's listening to your staff, and identifying those things that could be the lettuce leaf, the prompt for action. Yes, yes, I, I like that very much. And it's, um, it's, it's understanding that if you wait for things to go wrong, you've really lost the game. You know, you, you, there's, a, there's a danger to businesses, there's a danger to your services, but it's not only a people's lives affected in ways that are not good, there are also consequences for workplaces and businesses 
um, that um, they don't need those problems to happen. So think about them way in advance, do things, listen to your customers, listen to your employees, work out the situations, just think strategically and embrace that as part of best practice. There's a lot of good practice out there, but this is about using the carrot and the stick. This is, this is a, a, an opportunity for the legislation to drive that lift across the board. You also spoke in your presentation about access to justice. So the positive duties is really about um, taking proactive steps to stop discrimination before it happens. Um, obviously we can't prevent every aspect of discrimination. And so there still needs to be that complaint handling um, mechanism. It needs to be accessible, it needs to be fair. It needs to result in positive outcomes at the end of the day. Um, you said the commission receives more than 2000 complaints every year. The commission's function is to try and resolve those complaints through conciliation. And by and large, it's very successful in doing that. Um, so most of those complaints will go through a conciliation process. We know that between 70 and 75% of those processes result in a positive outcome at the end of the day. There's a successful conciliated outcome that both sides agree to. And we also know from feedback surveys that we get that both complainants and respondents are very satisfied with that process. Um, but that leaves still 25 to 30% of um, conciliations that don't achieve a positive outcome at the end of the day. And that's where the real access to justice issue, I think, in this position paper focuses. Um, the big idea, one of the big ideas in the paper is the idea of instituting or maybe reinstituting a layer in between conciliation and the courts. Um, what could that look like and how would that improve access to justice? It is a big idea. Um, and it was, I framed it in thinking, well, what did we lose? And, and what are the kinds of problems that people are telling us about? And what, how, how can we shift that? And what can we gain? What are the, the societal benefits that may result? And, and I should just um, confirm that the conciliation process is a real success story. It's been operating extremely effectively right through the history of the commission, even back when we was first set up in 1981. But it's, the, the removal of that layer and, and looking at what we lost and how perhaps bringing that layer back in again might meet some of those problems was one of those light bulb moments for me as I worked through um, the various things that people were saying. They, they were saying things like, you know, that, that courts are inaccessible, that evidence is a problem, that the costs are in, an insurmountable disincentive um, certainly for unmeritorious complaints, but most, most, most concerningly for meritorious complaints and also in terms of the, the representative support for people to, to take that journey. And I, and I thought about it and thought, well, look, the other element to that is it pushes it all back to conciliation and with conciliation, which is conducted in best practice as a confidential process, then you don't get that buildup of knowledge about the outcomes of what happens in conciliation, other than through very generalised, anonymized um, results. So, you know, that kind of middle layer, if we brought that middle layer back, and you did ask me what it would look like, well, it works well in the states and territories with the various administrative tribunals, the VCAT, NCAT, QCAT, and so on. Um, but in the federal severe, we, it's either us, all the courts. So the kinds of things, it would reduce formality, uh, would reduce cost, it would be more accessible, it would build up that body of decisions, not court decisions, but a tribunal jurisprudence that could create certainty and improve understanding. And then that flows back into the kinds of educational um, guidelines and other things that the Commission does very well, but the more certainty that there is, the more that we can give people guidelines about. And it also means that people can participate in those processes, whether as a complainant or as a respondent, with a greater sense of certainty as to what the parameters of the process might be. So, 
So you yeah. see sort of individual benefits for the people who are part of that process, but also broader benefits in terms of creating, like you say, this, this understanding, um, maybe creating a normative aspect to the resolution of discrimination complaints. Um, one thing that's often pointed to as a criticism of conciliation is that it's private. Um, but if you have more decisions, people know where they stand in terms of discrimination law, and maybe fewer people come um, with complaints in the first place. Yes, absolutely. And certainty was this, this need, this desire for certainty was a big thing. And um, the, with certainty comes a, an ability to manage expectations, whether, whether, and particularly from complainants, but also on the other side of the, 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 um, the conciliation process, complainants and respondents, the more certainty that's in there, the, the more effective the conciliation can be within those parameters as well. So um, it, it was one aspect that, that I certainly thought that by reintroducing a middle layer, some of those things that were lost and some of the problems that have been identified with this big gap between conciliation and the court could certainly be, be addressed. We don't propose the precise model, but rather that serious consideration should be given to this because it's a big idea. And uh, so it's one that we've raised. We've put the reasons for it on the table and really hope that people get behind us in backing it as a big idea, but also one that we see has the potential to make the whole system overall much more effective in enhancing access to justice. We're probably running short on time. So let me ask you a broader question. Um, we've seen some really welcome reforms this year in relation to sexual harassment in response to the recommendations from the Respect at Work report. Uh, the government has also said that it will respond to all of the recommendations in the Set the Standard report into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces. Um, both of those processes had a very high degree of public engagement. How optimistic are you about the prospects for reform of anti-discrimination law more generally? And what would it take to get it over the line? I think the, the, the work in, um, in the areas of sexual harassment, both respect to work and set the standard, generated great momentum. It's, we've got an alignment of opportunity. We have the momentum and the government responses in the area of sexual harassment. We've got the, the opportunity for rethinking things provided by the pandemic, momentum. But we've also got, I think, in, in the, the reforms that we are offering, we've taken that momentum, built upon it, complemented the recommendations concerning sexual harassment and overlaid a sophisticated and nuanced conceptualization of the opportunities for reform, the way to think it through, but there are also very, very practical suggestions as well. So in terms of a call for action, perhaps, is to capture that momentum, let it puff into the sails of enthusiasm to really lift the discrimination law framework into the 21st century. This is about all of you. It's about all of us. It's about improving the discrimination law framework for, for us, for our children, and for our children's children. So uh, now we need you to get on board with us. We can't do it by ourselves. We need to embrace our discrimination law reform agenda and urge you to become all of, with us, to become advocates for change. Well, on, on that positive note, thank you very much for um, taking the time to, to talk with me about the Commission's position paper on free and equal. I might now hand back to Leanne to wrap up for us. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Graham. And thank you, Professor Croucher, for delivering this year's Human Rights Day oration. And to you and Graham for, for sharing with us this timely and important work that's underway at the Commission to strengthen the promotion and protection of all people's human rights under Australian law. As we know, any country can ratify as many international human rights instruments as they like, but it is in the domestic implementation of international human rights law through our own legal system that human rights protections are made real, meaningful and effective for all Australians. So congratulations again to the Human Rights Award winners 
And as Chief Executive of the Commission, I'd like to close by sharing a sincere thank you to the sponsors for our 2021 Human Rights Awards, the European Union Delegation to Australia and Lexus Nexus Australia for their invaluable support to the Commission and to the awards. I'd also like to thank our partners, Social Deck, who produced today's event with us. We look forward to hopefully seeing you all again in person next year for the 2022 Human Rights Day Oration and the Human Rights Awards. So let me end by saying thank you all for joining us. Stay safe and enjoy the holiday season ahead.